Picture it, Chatham, Ontario in the 1960s. Greek immigrant Sam Panopoulos has two concerns which are soon to find a common solution. His first problem is he's still settling in and trying to acclimate himself to life in Canada and become more Canadian. His second problem is the food. Even in restaurants, he finds the fare to be painfully plain. One day, at Sam's own satellite restaurant, he decided to do something a little different. He assembled a pizza, itself still foreign and ethnic in those parts. And he took a page from the nearby Chinese restaurant, sprinkling the pizza with chunks of canned pineapple. My name's Moxie, and this is your Brain on Facts. As Mike Myers, in the guise of his mother-in-law Linda Richman, might say, a pineapple is neither a pine nor an apple. Discuss. It's actually a berry, or rather a group of berries that have fused together. The technical term for this is a multiple, collective, or aggregate fruit, a heading that includes strawberries, blackberries, and sweet gums. That's the tree in some parts of the U.S. that grows spike balls that pierce your feet, like a prehistoric weaponized koosh ball, one of which I've had next to my driveway for 20 years, whose identity I learned mere seconds before recording this. The scientific name of a pineapple is Ananas camosus, deriving from the indigenous Brazilian Tupi words for pine and tufted. The English-speaking world calls them pineapples because of the resemblance they bear to closed pine cones, especially the partially formed young green pine cones. Nearly the whole rest of the world's languages, from Arabic to Yiddish, call them ananas or something similar, with the notable exception of Spanish, in which they are called piña, giving us the name of the pineapple coconut cocktail, piña colada. In Hawaii, the imported pineapple, that's right, it's not even from there, is hala kahiki. Hala is a type of fruit that is indigenous to the island, which looks more like a jackfruit or a durian than a pineapple, and kahiki means foreign, so this was the foreign hala fruit. Let's wreck another misconception real quick. Pineapples do not grow on palm trees. So erase that image from your mind, and picture a single pineapple on top of a pointy shrub. If you know what a bromeliad is, that'll make it easier to picture, because pineapple is actually a bromeliad. The plant consists of a central stem surrounded by a whorl of tapered leaves that can grow up to five feet or one and a half meters long. The pineapple fruit grows from dozens of individual flowers that have fused together, capped with a crown of short leaves. Pineapple plants in the wild can live up to 50 years, but in all that time, they may only produce about 20 fruits because it takes two to three years for the plant to produce its one and only fruit that season. Something to think about when you're considering if the price at the grocery store is cheap enough. People who know their bananas will not be surprised that ananas are not grown from seeds. Cloning is by far the most popular method to grow pineapples commercially. You can clone a pineapple by replanting any one of four different parts of the plant the crowns, slips, suckers, and shoots. Slips are the leaves attached just below the fruit, and suckers and shoots both originate from near the bottom of the plant. We'll circle back to crown propagation later. Common commercial varieties of pineapple are self-incompatible, meaning that the plant's pollen cannot fertilize other plants of the same variety. So unless different varieties are grown next to one another and flower simultaneously, the plant will produce a seedless fruit that develops without fertilization. Pollination is required for seed formation, but commercial growers don't want that because the presence of seeds has a deleterious effect on the quality of the fruit. Possible pineapple pollinators include honeybees, pineapple bees, and hummingbirds. In fact, to preserve the taste and quality of the commercial crop, the state of Hawaii banned the import of hummingbirds. Pineapple can actually be tricked into flowering using smoke. Research has shown that the component in smoke responsible for the flowering is ethylene, 
This is the same gas that is given off by ripe or damaged fruit. Apples are a good example. And ethylene gas is used by many fruit and vegetable producing companies to speed up the ripening or artificially ripen the produce. Pro tip, if you have some bananas that you need to ripen more quickly and you have an apple that's seen some stuff, put them together in a paper bag. The bananas will ripen several times faster. And the forced flowering actually became standard procedure in Hawaii because it allowed the fruit to be produced all throughout the year. Bonus fact, the world's largest pineapple ever recorded was in 2011, grown by Christy McCollum of Bakewell, Australia. It weighed a whopping 18 pounds or 8.3 kilos. Try getting that at Aldi for a buck 19. Speaking of world records, we're just two weeks or two episodes away from episode 150, and still no word from the Guinness World Record people about my application for a record for most guest segments on a single podcast episode. The goal is to have 50 guest facts, read by the guest hosts, and there is still some space on the roster, so please let your favorite podcaster know that they should get in touch with me. Tag us on the social media, Facebook and Instagram.com slash yourbrainonfacts, Twitter at brainonfactspod, Especially if you can think of something cool that you learned from their show and feel like, hey, you know who else would like to hear that? If you knew one cool fact about pineapples before firing up your podcast player today, it was probably that pineapples contain bromelain, a protein digesting enzyme. People like to describe pineapple as the only food that eats you back. Most of those in the know think of bromelain for its meat tenderizing qualities. And boy howdy does it do that. Foodie friends should check out the Brazilian YouTuber Guga Foods. He does a lot of interesting and well-constructed experiments on steak, from sous vide and air frying to dry aging steak in peanut butter. Your man eats a lot of steak. And that includes tenderizing meat with the power of pineapple. Does it really work? Can you tell the difference? Does it taste like pineapple? I let the man tell you in his own words but you should definitely hit the link in the show notes to check out his channel. This one here. Let's go to the next one, Angel. Go for it. Is this the one I've been waiting for? This is the pineapple. Ooh. All right. This is so tender that the fat just fall off. Look at that. <laughs> Look at how tender this one is. You, you ready? ready? I'm ready. I've been I'm, ready. I'm, I'm born ready. I know you're excited for this one. Let's you do ready? it. We don't have to do anything else. Wow. We can stop right there. This one's tender. This one is super tender. It's fantastic, isn't it? They're gonna ask us if it tastes like pineapple. It doesn't taste like pineapple, but it has like, it has a little bit of sweetness. You think so? I think so, yeah. Compared to the last two, it had a little sweetness to it. Mm, I think it's just the tenderness. I'm not sure, but how do you like it? I don't like it, I love it. It's fantastic. It's so good, it was fire. It's fantastic, I really like it. Bromelain has been used for centuries in traditional medicine in Central and South America and even in modern medicine. The FDA classifies it as GRAS, generally recognized as safe, and it's handy stuff. Bromelain can be used topically to remove dead skin from healing burns, to reduce inflammation and swelling, particularly of the nasal passages, orally as a digestive aid, for osteoarthritis, and to reduce soreness and aching muscles. But the pills don't taste like pineapple. Hmm. How much pineapple would you need to eat to get the benefits of the bromelain? Or at that point, would it be too much acid for your tooth enamel? If you feel like looking that up for me, do tag me on the social media with the answer. The fruit most of us thought of as as iconically Hawaiian as the ukulele originally comes from South America. The ukulele, incidentally, is Portuguese. Pineapples first came to Europe courtesy of bad at math, good at pitch meetings, terrible at humanity, Christopher Columbus, who discovered pineapples in Guadalupe in 1493 and brought them back to Spain. It is no exaggeration to say that Europeans went wild for this exotic delicacy, described by one British landholder in Barbados as far beyond the choicest fruits of Europe. From the moment these exotic edibles hit British shores, they were an immediate smash hit, followed by the equally immediate and incontrovertible conclusion that they could not be cultivated in England. People still tried, though, and tried, and tried. For nearly 200 years, they kept at it, 
So desirable was that pineapple. Britain's climate is so anathema to tropical plants that the modern chocolate trade, when shipping cacao trees for transplant elsewhere, send them first to the UK to quarantine because none of the diseases they carry can survive there. European growers were finally able to succeed in the 18th century by dint of hothouses. A hothouse is slightly different from a greenhouse in that greenhouses are warmed exclusively by the sun and hothouses have some form of artificial heat. If you happen to have a hothouse or you live in a fairly warm climate and think you might give growing pineapples a go, I have good news and bad news. The good news is you can start a pineapple plant from the pineapple you got at the grocery store. Twist off the leafy crown and remove the lower inch or two of leaves. Let it dry for a day or so. Then put it in a jar of warm water, making sure to submerge only the leaf-free area. Change the water every few days, and when the crown has grown roots at least three inches long, you can plant it. After that, you're on your own. The bad news is, in addition to temperature and very specific soil characteristics, altitude is a factor in pineapple success. In Hawaii, the best pineapples in terms of sugar content and sugar acid balance grow in a band of elevation around 1,000 feet or 300 meters. So what made European botanists, horticulturalists, and agriculturalists so damn determined to make these things grow in a place they simply weren't meant to grow. It was the intersection of two characteristics. One, pineapples didn't survive the two months it took to get them from the New World to the Old. King Charles II was sent a shipment of pineapples, but only one arrived in still edible condition. Hopefully the sailors on that ship ate the pineapples as they started to turn because pineapples have more vitamin C than oranges. A few ounces of pineapple once a week could stave off scurvy, and I'm sure it would be a welcome break from rotten beef and weevily bread, at least for the first few weeks. King Chaz was absolutely smitten with his first and, for a while, only taste of pineapple. He had a portrait painted of his gardener handing him a pineapple, a cropped version of which was one of this week's Mystery Monday clues. And speaking of things British, congratulations to Dale for guessing correctly. And King Charles also called his favorite mistress his little pineapple. The aristocracy so revered this multi-fruit that they dubbed it King Pine. And reason two, the European diet didn't have a lot of sweet things in it. Cane sugar was expensive, being imported from Asia. Ripe fruit was generally only available in the moment it was ripe and honey was a treat for the rich or for the most special occasions, unless you kept your own bees. During the height of its popularity, pineapples would sell for as much as $8,000 a piece in today's money. If you couldn't afford to buy one, you could always rent it. That's right, you could rent a pineapple. Obviously, in that case, you can't eat it. So what do you do with it? You look at it. You have your friends round to look at it. You put it in the center of the table during a party so everybody can see how fabulously wealthy and fashionable and well-connected you must be to have gotten your hands on a pineapple. It wasn't uncommon for the hoi polloi to carry the pineapple around with them like a designer handbag. And to me, it makes about as much sense. Maybe you could crash someone else's party by bringing your fashionable pineapple along with you an even bigger douche move than that guy who always brings his guitar with him to parties and begins to play even though literally no one ever asked him to. Ever. Being such a valuable commodity, the pineapples had to be protected. Some nobles even had their servants sleep with the pineapples so they couldn't be stolen. Well, now I'm picturing an Ocean's Eleven-style heist movie to steal a single pineapple from a pedestal in the center of a room of sleeping servants sort of grand theft bromeliad. The close association with parties is how pineapples became iconographic of hospitality. They were incorporated into sculptures and building designs, both private and public. You can see pineapples atop St. Paul's Cathedral in London. But if you really love the look of a pineapple, you've got to go to Dunmore House in Falkirk, where not only does a giant stone pineapple adorn the entryway arch, 
you can stay in a building shaped like a pineapple. Pineapples even popped up in contemporary literature, including Charles Dickens' David Copperfield, in which the protagonist finds himself utterly fascinated by the pineapples in Covent Garden. To this day, it's a popular motif in home decor, though I swear I never saw it before we moved to the South. Pineapples may be sweet, but you know what's even sweeter? The people who take time out of their day to leave reviews for the show and the Your Brain on Facts book, which don't forget you can still get from yourbrainonfacts.com slash book. And yes, the audiobook version is coming. I just have no idea when. We have a book review from Michael R. who says, Great read and gift. This is a great book and does fire the brain cells in an entertaining way. I gifted Your Brain on Facts to my family last Christmas and also had positive responses from them. It's a book that should be in just about everyone's house. Thank you so much for that, Michael, and for thinking enough of it to give it to others. Over on the podcast review side of things, we've got two from over on podchaser.com, which is like the IMDb of podcasts and is handy to use if your app doesn't let you leave reviews. And while I read these in the order in which they come in, I do want to tip my hat to someone with a sweet username who left me a review that made me just have to sit there with it for a couple of minutes. But this week, we're starting with a review from Brooklyn, who says, Longtime listener, just took a while to get around to leaving a review. I totally understand that. Moxie is the best, and this is the only podcast I listen to repeatedly. Not gonna lie, most of the time, it's to help me get to sleep. Her voice is soothing, and the facts help clear my head to get me to sleep. Then I'll wake up and usually listen to them on my way into work. Might be why I have about 10,000 listening hours. Oops. I don't mind that in the slightest, and I never have. They say Bob Ross was always delighted every time someone said to him that his voice put them to sleep. I understand the feeling now. And another review from, I'm just going to read it phonetically, Dismas. Been listening to this podcast for about a month now, and I've really enjoyed it. I like that the facts follow a bit of stream of consciousness in how they're presented, so it never feels like a slog through a topic that might not always strike my fancy. Moxie's voice, of course I have to mention her voice, is mellifluous. Normally I get bored with shows with a single host, but she mixes it up with other voices to read quotes or uses audio effects on her own voice to break up that monotony. I appreciate that the facts are well-researched and don't come off as a BuzzFeed or Mental Floss 10 Things You'll Never Believe type of faux research. The facts are weird and wonderful. Remember, if you want to hear your opinions read out on the show, just leave a review. And if you'd like to support the show in other ways, we do, of course, have patreon.com slash yourbrainonfacts. And welcome to our latest supporter, Jellybean. Folks over on the Patreon get bonus content, and I swear we are working on bringing back Spot the Lie. You ever try to get a D&D session going on the regular when everybody's a working adult with kids? It's tricky. But you also get early access to the episodes literally as soon as I finish making them, as well as ad-free versions in the weeks that I have sponsorship. But the very best way of all is and always has been sharing your favorite podcast with others. Word of mouth is still how podcasts grow. So pineapples made the long trip from South America to Europe, but then they had to find their way back to the New World, and to the far side of a different continent, to find the place they're most closely associated with today. Most of the credit or blame for this manufactured association falls to one man, James Dole. He wasn't the first in his family to settle in Hawaii, His grandfather Daniel arrived there in 1840 as a Christian missionary, with sights set on converting the native Hawaiians. Missionaries had a significant impact on Hawaiian governance, imposing Western notions of property ownership, which cultivated in a massive land grab where stolen land was sold to Anglo-American businessmen and investors. Fifty years later, another dole, sugar tycoon Sanford Dole, led the coup d'etat against Queen Liliolukalani in 1893 and was named president of the new provincial government. Inspired, young James purchased a 60-acre homestead on Oahu and experimented with a number of cash crops before settling on the pineapple. 
The tropical climate, the advent of the Industrial Revolution, and one often untold factor that I'll come back to momentarily, all coalesced to form rows and rows of spiky pineapple plants cropping up all over the state. Dole eventually invested in a machine that could skin, core, and slice the fruit much faster than the workers could by hand, a bit like the cotton gin in the mainland south. And many competing companies bought one, too. Bob's your uncle, the pineapple was now a commercial crop, putting Hawaii on the map as an agricultural powerhouse. By the 1930s, Hawaii was home to the world's largest canneries and had established itself as the global leader in pineapple production. The companies lured laborers away from the sugarcane fields with promises of higher wages and better working conditions. That may have been true, but it wasn't by a lot, and it wasn't like the work was any easier. And that is the third point I alluded to, a socially subjugated workforce with few options otherwise and no real power of their own. For long, sun-beaten hours, workers planted pineapples by hand and harvested them into lug boxes to load onto trucks. Pesticides and fertilizers were used extensively. Personal protective equipment, not so much. In addition to risking the health of the plantation workers, it also contaminated the soil and groundwater, that old chestnut. James Dole believed that the success of the business and industry depended upon product visibility, and that marketing pineapple required the commodification of Hawaiian culture. Aloha, the hula, the unparalleled beauty of the landscape, even the beauty of the people were commoditized. These very images featured prominently in Hawaiian Pineapple Company and Dole Company advertisements of the time. While the native Hawaiians baked in the fields, Ad men in cool offices pushed and shaped the Hawaiian pineapple image and the image of Hawaii in general, making sure that pineapples featured prominently on travel brochures and posters, adding to the area's tourist appeal and the rise of the tiki aesthetic, which is tacky in the wrong way when you think about it. Recipes were created to entice mainland housewives to buy more canned pineapple, such as the thoroughly dubious candle salad. On a bed of a few lettuce leaves, place a ring of pineapple, and in that ring, stand a banana straight up. Top it with half a maraschino cherry. Garnish with whipped cream. I will let you visualize how and where you might do that. After World War II, the pineapple industry began to shift to places like the Philippines and Thailand, and Hawaii lost its market superiority. The glory days faded further in the 1980s, when Dole Food Company and Del Monte closed up shop and moved overseas. The final nail in the commercial coffin came in 2009, when Maui Land and Pineapple announced it would shut down its operations. The state currently produces only 10% of the world's pineapple, from just a handful of small-scale operations. Most of the once-thriving fields now lay empty. Canneries have been converted to museums and shopping malls. Why? Because tourists are more profitable than pineapples. Not that tourism is without its drawbacks. In addition to the environmental impact and what is essentially tropical gentrification, wherein real estate developers make it impossible for Native Hawaiians to live where they've always lived, at statehood, Native Hawaiians outnumber the tourists two to one. Today, tourists outnumber the Native Hawaiians 30 to one. All because of a pineapple. And maybe Hawaii's strategic military value during World War II, I guess. And that's where we run out of ideas, at least for today. When Sam Panopoulos created the first Hawaiian pizza, regular pizza was still such an outlier that Sam had to cut his own pizza boxes from leftover cardboard. But the tiki craze of the 1950s meant his customers were well familiar with canned pineapple, and people were open to trying it. As pizza chains and franchises sprung up across the country in the latter half of the 20th century, Along with them came Hawaiian pizza, installing itself as a second-string menu item for families to argue about. 
And for everyone out there hating on pineapple on pizza, A, you're wrong. B, be glad you're not in Sweden, where they top theirs with curry powder and bananas. Remember, you can always find the script for the show and the source links at yourbrainonfacts.com. Thanks for spending part of your day with me, and stay safe. One last thing. The long-held belief that drinking pineapple juice will improve the flavor of amorous bodily fluids? Yeah, sorry, no. But we appreciate the effort, and at least you won't get scurvy while you wait for date night. <laughs>